Hello and welcome to this week's used car heaven. Lots more to come in this program, including more from our car doctor. And in part two, we're driving two budget cars from the Far East, from Korea in fact. Plus Richard Hammond will have more tips and tricks from the used car trade. But in part one, we're driving two Alfa Romeos and they're both red, a 156, and a 146. Both of these cars are beginning to get cheaper and cheaper in the marketplace. What sort of price do you need to pay to get a good one and what do you need to look out for? We'll show you on Used Car Heaven. You don't see that many Alfa Romeo 146s on the roads these days and that's kind of reflected in the price that you can buy them. And you couldn't honestly say that the 146 is a gorgeous car to look at because it's not. It's rather quirky in its styling. But Alfa were beginning to get things right with the 146 back in the mid 90s when they introduced this car because before that they'd had terrible problems with reliability and rust and all sorts of things. You look at the interior of the 146 and it does look a bit dated now. It's more 1980s than 1990s. So-called leather seats, which look more like plastic. You do get a good amount of rear leg room for the passengers in the 146. And remember, this is the slightly bigger version of the Alpha 145, five doors and a decent boot as well. So if at the moment you're looking for a used car and you want something that's not too big but not too small and perhaps that is a little bit different but isn't too expensive, why not consider an Alfa Romeo 146? I bet you've probably never even considered buying one of these cars, but they're getting to be quite a good buy. There are a small amount around, some from main dealers and some from specialist dealers, but this car seems to be quite good value for money. The Alpha 146 was launched in 1995, a year after its baby brother, the 145, and the difference between the two cars is that one's a three-door and one's a five-door, and this car gets marginally more room than the 145. It's rather strange that they continue to make this car up until about 2000. Last cars of the 146 would be on an X-plate, and they're fairly similar in terms of size and space to the 156. There are lots of engines to choose from in the 146 range, 1 1.6, 1.7, 1 1.8 and 2 litre petrol engines. No diesels, but the pick of the cars to go for are the twin sparks, which come in 1.6, 1.8 and in this 2 litre form. This car gets 150 brake horsepower and it's very responsive and feels very nippy. It's got a nice sound to the engine as well. The steering is very sharp and responsive, nice clutch and gearbox, and it will still average around 32 miles to the gallon. So how would I sum up the Alpha 146? Well, it's the sort of car that you'd buy if you want to be a little bit different. You don't want to be the norm and have a Ford Focus or a Peugeot 306 or a Honda Civic or something like that. And it's pretty good value for money. And you have to be aware that there may be one or two little niggly problems, particularly with the electrics in Alfa Romeos. But apart from that, I reckon the 146 is a pretty decent car. The Alfa Romeo 146 and its smaller version, the 145, are unusual and rare sights on the road. Never a big seller, the 146 is coming down in price. Worth buying a car from a main dealer or a specialist, but beware tatty cars and watch for electrical problems. Buying a used car is not the easiest thing in the world to do. But if you're bothered by bargaining or worried about your wheels, don't fret. Because I'm here with the definitive guide to buying a used car. So, you know what you want to buy, you've done your research, you know how much you're going to spend on it, and you probably have a good idea about how you're going to pay for it. Well, you can't put it off forever, you've got to go into battle and buy that car. But before you do it, I set up a meeting with a guy who's going to give us the insider's view, just an impression of the motor industry side of things. The car industry hasn't always had the best reputation. What kind of are they all out to, to get us? Are you all out to get our money? Uh, I would have to say no. Uh, on the first instance, we're not out to get you. We're out to make a reasonable living. Um, I think the motor industry has become a lot more professional over the last 20 years. Got a lot of professionals working in it. Um, we're here as a service industry. We're here as retailers as opposed to dealers. I think um, 
uh, characters like Arthur Daly that have been portrayed on television don't really do very much uh, for the industry. Um, we have had um, 18 months of uh, a very poor reputation with regard to pricing, but that's very much down to the manufacturers and not the dealers. So, are there actual tricks that can be used in the trade that are going to convince us to part with more of our money than we expected to? Um, obviously, um, th there are people in the business who um, use certain techniques. There are some American techniques in, in retailing that are employed in this country. Uh, I know of a few, and I know some people that have used them in the past. I think the British public is a lot more sophisticated than perhaps, dare I say, the <laughs> No, um, the Yanks American can be gullible. Market. I agree, they'll, um, they'll fall for it. I think Americans really like um, the whole process of being sold to. I think in, in Britain uh, it's, it's a very much diff diff different matter. That's an important point though, because we Brits, we're not very good at the whole being in a selling environment, particularly when it comes to talking about uh, <clears throat> money, filthy stuff. We get embarrassed, don't we? None of my customers have been um, shy in coming forward about their part exchange value in the past. They're always very keen to get the Fairly best bold price. to talk about money. Yes. You mentioned these techniques. What are they? Well, some, some dealerships employ uh, some American tactics, such as the pendle system, um, which is where the dealership will turn all of the used cars around on the forecourt facing inwards, take the prices out of the windscreens, um, to make the customer ask the question, how much is that car? try to get them into an early so conversation. So straight away you've opened it up as a customer and they've got you? Well, it's not a question of getting you. Um, they employ things like uh, making very hot cups of coffee that, that take about Ooh. half an hour to drink. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> well, so that you just sit there and you don't go away. Well, you can't get away until you drink your <laughs> coffee. So as somebody who runs a dealership, you have salespeople working for you. If you were to just walk into a dealership as a punter, could you tell? If, if a salesperson came up, could you tell if they were going to try and put one over on you? I think at the end of the day, um, a, a, for a customer to um, um, recognise a good salesperson, and that's good from their point of view, is someone that's prepared to listen. Uh, ultimately, a, a salesman should qualify the customer, find out his needs, his wants, his requirements from a car. You know, does this person, is this person married, uh, do they have children, what sort of driving do they do, motorway driving, what sort of engine size do you need, do you need manual or automatic if you're disabled or whatever. Um, and for the, for, for the salesman to actually listen to the answers. And once that salesman has roughly formed an opinion as to what car would suit you best, guides you towards that, that product. Alfa Romeo really got things right when they launched the 156 in 1998 and it was awarded the accolade of European Car of the Year and rightly so. It's a four-door saloon which looks more like a coupe. The rear door handles are cleverly hidden in that rear area of the car and inside, well it's just absolutely gorgeous. I can think of no other car that has this sort of stylish interior, well put together, gorgeously swooping and sweeping lines of the dashboard, two binnacles for the speedo and the rev counter, and three dials here pointing towards the driver for the temperature, for the clock, and for the fuel gauge. And at the front, what Alpha had to do was move the number plate slightly to the left-hand side of the car there to make way for the gorgeous Alpha shield. <laughs> This Alpha 156 is a 1.8 Twin Spark and it's the Veloci model. There are three basic trim levels in the 156 range. There's the standard car, there's the Lusso, which is the more luxurious and gets leather upholstery, and this Veloci is the sporty version. So it has sport suspension, it has extra side skirts, and it has gorgeous alloy wheels. Having said that, the ride is actually very good. It's not too firm, just nicely weighted. The power steering is nice, the five-speed gearbox is slick and smooth. I think for a long time Alfa Romeo have been the nearly men of motoring. They've been nearly as good as the Germans, but not quite. But with the arrival of the 156, they got up there and they mixed it about with the BMW 3 Series, the Audi A4 and the Mercedes C-Class.
Since its launch in 1998, the Alfa Romeo 156 has sold very well and there are plenty of cars to buy on the used car market, either from main dealers where they tend to be slightly overpriced or privately or through specialist dealers or car supermarkets, things like that. And the 156 really reflects the Italian's flair and design style. I think it's a gorgeous car to look at both inside and out. Lots of different models in the 156 range to choose from. Engines, well, you've got 1.6, 1.8, 2 litre and a 2.5 V6 along with a 2.4 turbo diesel. This is a 1.8 producing around about 120 brake horsepower. The 2.5 V6 is probably the smoothest of the cars with 190 brake horsepower, but rather surprisingly, the best cars to drive are either these 1.8 or the two litre cars. So what about prices? What do you have to pay to get a used 156? Well, this car would cost you about 10 and a half thousand pounds. This is around a year old. It's done 21,000 miles, so it's slightly above average on the mileage, but it will cost you around 10 and a half thousand pounds. Alpha did slash the price of their new cars quite dramatically by around £3,000. So that's had a knock-on effect into the used car market, where early R-Edge cars are now getting as low as £8,000. Are there many more stylish cars on the road than the Alfa Romeo 156? This is the car that dragged Alfa Romeo back into the big time and into the mainstream with British car buyers. Residuals aren't as strong as a 3 Series or a C-Class, but Oodles more style goes some way to make up for that. So there we are, two very desirable Alfa Romeos, which I hope we've shown you can be yours for not too much money. That's it for part one of Used Car Heaven. Join us again for more in part two, when we'll be driving two budget cars from Korea. Hello and welcome back to part two of Used Car Heaven. Coming up on this part of the programme, we're driving two budget cars from Korea. And the first of those cars is so small, look, I can fit it in my hand. It's a Deu Matiz. The Deu Matiz is what's affectionately known as a city car. And a few years ago, many car manufacturers jumped on the bandwagon and thought that this was the way forward for cars in the future. And although it seems quite dinky and quite minute, it's not as small as you might think. Although having said that, it is quite a tall car which gives lots of headroom for passengers. Rear seat passengers are perhaps a little cramped in the rear. And as for the boot, well, I always thought that city cars were designed so that you could go shopping and load all your bags in there. But that boot space just doesn't bear thinking about. You could hardly say that the Deu Matiz is a stunning looking car, but it does have a somewhat chic, elegant look to it. And it actually sort of belies its size. It's very, very small outside, but inside it's reasonably roomy and fairly well put together. You can imagine certain parts of our community thinking that, you know, they'll take the Deu Matiz today rather than go shopping in the Merc because it's just easier to park. And it is quite a reasonable car to drive. The power steering is very good, nicely weighted. The gearbox is not fantastic though. It rather crunches through the gears, particularly when you're changing down. This isn't the sort of car that I want to go a long journey on with two or three passengers and lots of luggage. However, these cars are incredibly cheap. They're not expensive to buy new. We're talking about six and a half to seven thousand pounds new. And that means they're also cheap on the used car market too. This car is a year old. It's done 12,000 miles and you could pick this car up for about four and a half thousand pounds now. So you're thinking to yourself, what's under the bonnet of this little beauty? Well, it's a mammoth. 800cc engine. I think I've seen bigger engines in lawnmowers, but anyway, we won't talk about the power. Well, we will. That's only 50 brake horsepower. Nought to 60 time, you don't want it even though. It kind of gets there eventually. And it'll do a top speed of just about 70 or 80 miles an hour, but by that time, you're really kind of holding on for dear life. 
I know that the size of a car matters to some people. To me, it doesn't affect me at all. The bigger, the better, as far as I'm concerned. But I can see why certain people would want something that's small, manageable, and easy to manoeuvre. And the day images certainly seems to fit the bill. Ideal, perhaps, for a small family or for a retired couple. And at these sort of prices, you can't go wrong. And now it's time for a visit to our car doctor in his surgery. When vehicles and equipment start to age, telltale signs are rust and peeling paint. And very often the best option for your motor car is sending it to the Two Foot Square Club, better known as the Scrapyard. But how can you get the best value for money out of your car? Now I know a few people that can make a living from buying old cars like this, seeing the potential in them and selling them for a profit. Now there's a few things that we need to look at, in fact we've got three main parts on this that I want to show you, so let's have a look at this. The first thing we're going to look at is this horrible flat paintwork that you can see all over the car. It's actually all oxidised and when you rub your hand on it you can actually see it comes off on your hands and that looks like it needs respraying. We've also got bits of paintwork here that need touching in and we're also going to be looking at uh, a repair that someone's previously had a look at on the other side. Well, you can see here that we've got uh, a rusty bit that needs some attention. So we're going to deal with that by using an art brush with a little bit of car paint on. And we're going to just dab it on there very carefully. Don't put too much on. And there we go. It might need an, uh, another uh, coat later on, but you can certainly see how effective that is, certainly from a distance. Now, there's a few more areas on the car that need attention. So we're going to go and look at those as well. <laughs> Right, you can see here, the next part is uh, this area that somebody started to repair before. It has been a hole at some point and it's been filled. Now, for us to try and touch that in, it's going to look ridiculous. We're not going to be able to hide it at all. Um, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to make a feature of it and we're going to uh, actually mask up the whole side of the car and instead of painting it white, which we haven't necessarily got the skills to do that, we're actually going to paint it black and make it look like part of the car styling. Now, it's quite uh, a tricky job to mask it up. The painting's easy, but the masking's difficult. So you've got to watch very, very carefully. Well, I think you'll agree that we've certainly made this car look a lot, lot better and all for a very small budget. Uh, we've done all the different areas, we've sorted the paintwork out, uh, we've done a bit of touching up and we've customised it along here to hide a bit of corrosion. So I'm sure you'll agree that we've quite easily turned a £25 lemon into a £400 peach and all on a budget of about 15 quid. I think we've not done too bad. When Hyundai launched this car a few years ago, they wanted to take the budget coupe market by storm. And to a certain extent, they've succeeded in that. When they initially launched the car in some of their press advertising, they compared the coupe rather favourably with the looks of a Ferrari. Not quite sure how they managed to work that one out, though. Ooh, la, 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 la. Now, I've walked around this car time and time again, trying to look for similarities between this and a Ferrari, and I just can't see any at all. However, the Hyundai Coupe is a stylish car. Now, many cars from the Far East have a rather dull and drab interior, but not so the Hyundai Coupe, which is rather smart inside. Plus, you get cosseted with just about every conceivable extra. You've got leather upholstery, you've got twin airbags, you've got electric windows and electric mirrors, cruise control and climate control as well. So how does it actually drive? Get on it. 
So if you haven't got that much money to spend on a car, but you're desperate to buy a really good looking coupe, then perhaps the Hyundai coupe just might fit the bill. It's been on the market for around four years now, and there are plenty out there on the used car market, and prices are beginning to slip back. I mean, they're not tremendously expensive new, but that means you can pick up a real bargain on the used car market like this one. So new, we're only talking about 14 or 15 and a half thousand pounds for the two different models in the coupe range, 1.6 or a two litre. Now, this car is a two litre and it's an automatic. It's done 28,000 miles and you could pick this sort of car up for around nine grand. I can think of no other car on the market in coupe form that's as good as the Hyundai Coupe or as cheap. The 1.6 engine produces 111 brake horsepower and this two litre unit 137 brake horsepower. Good enough to get it to 60 miles an hour in around about eight seconds. Fuel economy is good too, averaging around 30 miles to the gallon and insurance pretty low, ranging between group nine and group 12. The main rivals for the Hyundai Coupe on the market would be something like the Toyota Paseo or the Honda Civic. But I think that the Coupe from Hyundai is a better car than either of those two. And these are getting fairly cheap as well. Look for an early car, you'd find those on a P-Reg, something with say 50,000 miles on the clock, you could pick up for as little as 5,000 pounds. There's absolutely no doubt that Korean cars are getting better and better, and here's two fine examples on the program today. The Daewoo Matiz, cute and dinky, and the Hyundai Coupe, stylish and elegant. That's it for this week's used car heaven. Join us again at the same time next week.